In my sermon tonight, I'd like to talk about two things, conformity and unity, and how each is used to create only one church. These ideas are very important for us as Christians because they determine what our basic experience will be like in the, in the body of Christ. Conformity and unity are words that refer to how people relate to and remain part of a group, any group, including a church group. So let's take a, a look at each word and break it down to see how it works. Conformity. Conformity basically means to become the same. So creating a group and keeping it together using the principle of conformity means that pressure is applied to make sure everyone thinks and acts and even looks the same. Let me give you a picture of conformity. There's conformity for you. School uniforms, no mixing with people outside the group, repeating the rules, no changes in procedure, no room for individual freedom or personal opinion or differences, conformity. These are all methods used to form and maintain and grow a group using conformity as the basic idea. Now there's, there's some advantages to this, of course, in using conformity. For example, it's easier to establish and grow a group where everyone is the same. It's easy to spot and eliminate the troublemakers. Who are the troublemakers? Well, they're different. So we get rid of the troublemakers if we want conformity. Also, a group built on conformity is usually easier to control from the, from the top down. Fewer leaders can control a larger number of people since there is only a single goal to pursue, and that is conformity. And then, of course, conformity is comfortable. People like conformist religious groups because they feel safe. Everybody's the same, their environment is controlled, no need to think differently, just keep working on conformity. Of course, there's also a downside to conformity as an approach to establishing and maintaining a religious group. For example, people are not machines. People like to ask questions. People want to express themselves. This causes turmoil in a conformist group. Another downside to conformity. Conformity breeds competition. People within the group begin to compete to find who conforms the best and thus they rise up in leadership. In conformist groups, leadership is based on performance and performance stimulates competition and competition produces rivalry and rivalry produces jealousy and all kinds of negative emotional sinfulness. And then of course, conformity and perhaps the worst downside feature when it comes to religious groups is the fact that it's not the biblical method given to establish, build and nurture the church. The biblical methodology when it comes to groups is called unification. So let's talk about the other word that I mentioned before and that is unity. The dictionary defines unity as the state of being made one. Whereas conformity tries to create a group by forcing each individual to become the same, Unity creates a group by getting each individual to commonly share the same thing or the same person. You see, with unity, people become part of a group because they each hold to a common idea while maintaining their individuality. The pressure to keep them inside the group comes from within, like a magnet that draws everyone to the center rather than a fence that prevents everybody from getting out. In Ephesians chapter four, Paul talks about the unity that exists in the church, how it was established and how to maintain it. And now that we've kind of explored the difference between unity and conformity, let's go uh, to this passage. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, you can go to Ephesians chapter four 
and we'll examine this text a little more closely. Now just a little background on the first three chapters of Ephesians to help us understand what Paul is talking about when we get to chapter four. Paul in the first three chapters lists all the things that God has done for the Ephesians. For example, he's planned for their salvation before the beginning of time. He has prepared spiritual gifts waiting for them in heaven. He's created a link or a union between himself and Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the church in spiritual oneness. These are all things that Paul talks about in the first three chapters of Ephesians. When he gets to chapter four, this is where we'll begin, Paul then explains the response that God expects from the church because of all the things he's done for it. He'll mention that the number one thing that God expects from the group or the church that he has established through Jesus Christ and what's so interesting is that the first and foremost thing he requires is that the church preserve the unity, not conformity, the unity that he has already established within the group. So let's go to chapter four and read verses one to three to see Paul's call to unity among brothers and sisters in the church. So we have the call to unity beginning in chapter four. He says, therefore, I the prisoner of the Lord implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So he begins by exhorting them to, did you note, to preserve the unity that already exists to which they, the church, were added. The church doesn't create unity. Unity already exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus gave his life to create the church and gave his word to instruct the church and the Holy Spirit to sustain the church, he made the church part of this unified Godhead. That's an important idea that we need to think about for a moment. The unity already exists in the unified Godhead. God has added the church to that unified Godhead and has said to the church, you need to remain unified as we are unified. Jesus is part of the divine and unified Godhead and the church through the cross and the word and the Holy Spirit is part of Jesus. Therefore the church is also through its connection to Jesus part of the unified Godhead. Every person, Jew or Gentile, who becomes part of the church also becomes part of the unified Godhead. What happened to you tonight, young sister, is that you became part of the unified Godhead. And you'll understand that as you grow in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus, as Paul has explained, has maintained his unity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. How? By accomplishing the plan of salvation. And now Paul explains what the church must do in order to maintain its unity with Christ. You see, Disunity in the church equals disunity with Christ and the Godhead. This is why unity is such an important issue. It's not just that we all get along, that's part of it. It's that we maintain something spiritual and not break that up. The threat of division at, Eph at Ephesus also carried the danger of loss of unity with Christ. Yes, it's one thing to lose unity uh, among ourselves, but in doing so, we risk losing unity with Christ, which he himself established through the cross. And so Paul begins by, uh, this section by encouraging them to pres preserve unity. And he explains how they are to preserve unity. And it's not about projects. 
It's not about projects or adding a, a meeting or anything like that. That's not how to preserve unity. Preserving the unity requires that we have a certain attitude toward one another in the church. And Paul explains what this attitude should be made of. And he mentions four things. First of all, he mentions humility. In other words, in order to preserve unity in the group, the individuals in the group have to practice humility. What's humility? Well, it's the opposite of pride. It's the opposite of vanity. A, 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 a good definition of, unit, of humility is an accurate assessment of self. I give an accurate assessment of what I am and who I am. Not more than what I am and not less than what I am, but exactly what I am. That's true biblical humility. Then he talks about meekness. Some of your Bibles have the word gentleness. Meekness means not self-willed. The shortest definition, not self-willed. You know, people say, you know, my way or the highway, that's the opposite of meekness. A person who is meek and gentle is someone that can go do things somebody else's way. That doesn't always have to have their way. That's meekness. Can you see how important that is in order to preserve unity within a group? Then he mentions patience. Patience is a willingness to put up with trials and suffering and failure without losing control, without losing cheerfulness, without losing love, without losing our bearing. Everybody suffers something. I know most of you and I know most of the things that you suffer over the many years that we've known each other. Patience is about maintaining your bearing, your ability to love, your ability to see the good despite the discouragements taking place in your life. That's patience. And then he mentions forbearance. Another word for forbearance, to make allowance for to make allowance for, the ability to not allow the action of others to provoke us. We make allowance for. My wife, I always say, has great forbearance because she makes allowances for the grandkids, for me, for the kids, for somebody I don't like. <laughs> she makes allowances for people. She teaches me about forbearance. And so Paul tells the church that in Christ, both Jew and Gentile are equally blessed, equally saved, equally precious to God. And now he exhorts them that by the means of humility and patience and meekness and forbearance, they should preserve the unity of which they were made a part of when Jesus brought them into the church. Secondly, the basis of unity in verses four to six, I'll read in a moment. As I said before, many times we confuse unity with conformity. Remember that conformity is sameness. We become the same as something or someone else. McDonald's, for example, they're all about conformity. You know, you, you, you have the special sauce when you eat the burger over here on 23rd, the special sauce. And if you go to New York, you're going to taste the same special sauce. Or if you go to Tokyo, you're going to taste the same special sauce. Conformity, conformity. Everybody's dressed the same. The food tastes the same. Every, uh, that's okay uh, for McDonald's, but not for the church. Unity is the experience of sharing. We share a similar hope, a similar leader, a similar ideal. This is the basis of unity. In verses four to six in the passage we're looking at, Paul will mention seven objective elements that Christians share, which serve to bring them into one unit. And so in verse four to six, he says, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So we're united because we share one body. There's only one group of the saved 
and we share in that group. There's only one spirit, one Holy Spirit, his work, his word, his living within the believers. There's only one spirit. We're united because we share one hope, that salvation and its effects. We're united because we share one Lord, Jesus. We can't serve two masters. We only share one master, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We're united because we share one faith, the teachings of Jesus Christ and the apostles. They only taught one thing. We share those teachings. We are united because we share one baptism, immersion in water, as an expression of faith in Jesus Christ, Acts 2, 37, 38, which we witnessed tonight. I mean, I was sitting there thanking the Lord. Oh Lord, thank you so much. Of all the things to happen before I got up to preach this sermon, we have a, we have a, a, a baptism. There is only one baptism that puts us into one body, that gives us one spirit, that permits us one hope, that unites us to our Lord. Uh, from 3,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people uh, were baptized until today, it's still the same one baptism. The people 3,000 years ago said the very same thing that she said just a few uh, moments ago. And of course, we are united because we share one God, the creator of heaven and earth, one God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, one God, the God who sent Jesus Christ, one God. We share that God in the church. And so Paul's point with all of these is that these things, these beliefs, these responses on our part unite us to Christ, unite us to God, and unite us to one another. They are the center, they are the magnet that hold all of us together. You watched her being baptized, did you not think about your own baptism? Or the day perhaps that like Shannon, you, you baptized your own daughter or your own son or the, the great and sweet pleasure of baptizing your own grandchild? We share all of this together. As, as one. They are at the center and these things hold us together as one. In baptism I am united to Christ and through Him I'm united to God and the Holy Spirit, but also I'm united to everyone else who has experienced the same one baptism. We are united by the experience of all of these things. Of course the opposite is true as well. To be divided from these things is also to be divided from Christ and divided from each other. So maintaining the unity that exists in the church requires a right type of attitude towards one another and a sharing of the elements of our faith. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. That's what unites us. And then God helps us to maintain this unity. I should be saying, Paul says, you know, uh, he makes the call to unity, he explains what the basis of unity is, and then he explains how God helps us to maintain this unity in verses seven to 13. Of course, we're not left alone to maintain unity. God helps us with certain gifts that he provides and Paul describes a set of gifts that we rarely perceive as gifts. And so he says in verses seven to 10, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all heavens, so that he might fill all things. And so in regards to this unity and the maintaining of it, each person has received a gift, grace if you wish, in order to contribute to the maintaining of this unity. This grace, this gift, Paul says, has been given by Christ to each and given according to his ability, or his fullness 
to give out these gifts? And there is a hidden rhetorical question right here. And the hidden rhetorical question is this, well, just how able is Jesus to give these gifts? And so Paul answers in verse eight by quoting an Old Testament Psalm, Psalm 68, 18, that summarizes Christ's achievements on behalf of men. You're asking me, how able is Jesus to give gifts to men? Well, he went to the underworld to show himself so that uh, those who rejected God, even from the days of Noah, would see that their lack of faith was in error and that judgment uh, that they received was true. 1 Peter 3.19 talks about that. In other words, uh, he has died and he has gone to the underworld. He has resurrected and then ascended to the right hand of God in the highest of heavens. Therefore, his presence fills both the physical and the spiritual realms from top to bottom. And someone will say, well, so what? Well, so what? The point is that Jesus is able to supply abundantly the gifts that are needed to maintain this unity. In other words, if anybody can provide what is needed to uh, maintain the unity of the church, Jesus Christ can do this. Why? He went down below, he went up to the highest heavens, he fills everything. That's why he can do what he says he could do. So, Jesus fills everything. Therefore, he does not lack the ability to give us everything we need in order to maintain unity. And so in verse 11, he continues and says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. And so in these verses, Paul describes the gifts that Christ gives. And we find out that they're not powers, they're people. Each is a gift in two ways. First, you have the gift yourself to carry out a ministry as one of these people, or you receive the gift of ministry from one of these people. Either way, they are gifts that help the church maintain unity. And the gifts that he mentions are the following. He says the apostles, their gifts. Apostles were messengers chosen by Christ to witness the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ and to record the New Testament. Uh, we continue in their teachings uh, today. And he also mentions the prophets. There were different types of prophets in the Old Testament, prophets like Isaiah who foretold uh, the future. In the New Testament, prophets like Agabus, who also foretold the future, but there were also other prophets who spoke God's word from inspiration before the Bible was uh, uh, completely uh, recorded. Today, the work of the apostles and the work of the prophets has been, uh, is done by the New Testament, by the Bible itself. It takes the place of the apostles and the prophets. He also uh, mentions uh, evangelists. Evangelists are those who proclaim the gospel. Philip, for example, was an evangelist. They organized and established congregations. They promoted unity within the congregation. People like Titus and Timothy were sent to uh, various congregations in order to do this kind of work. And then he mentions pastors and teachers elders who shepherd by teaching, Acts chapter 20, and those who teach the word in the church, but who do not shepherd, Acts uh, chapter 13. Here's the point. These were the gifts. These were the gifts that God through the Spirit gave uh, to the church. And they are the same gifts that we receive today. We have apostles and prophets contained in the Bible that teach us and guide us and give us the witness of Christ's resurrection. But we also have evangelists and we have shepherds and we have teachers that lead and bless uh, the church. And so Paul continues in verse 12 and 13, he says, for the equipping of the saints, in other words, what's their work, these gifts? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service 
to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So their work consists of building up the church and maintaining that unity that Paul speaks of at the beginning of this chapter. Well, how do they do this? Well, they supply each saint what he or she needs to serve others in the body and thus create and maintain unity. That's their task. They serve the body to achieve what goal? To achieve the perfect unity in Christ that God requires. Well, how do they do this? Well, they promote and they model the unity of the faith. In other words, each member becomes mature in the knowledge of Christ and his or her salvation. These gifts help each member achieve that goal. These gifts help in the unity of relationships. Each member matures in Christian love for God and others. And where does each member learn how to do this? From the uh, apostles and prophets and in person from the elders and the, and, and the teachers. And, 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 and uh, they also promote and model the unity of service. In other words, each member begins to bear fruit in ministry. How? Well, they're modeled and they're taught and they're encouraged and they're mentored. By who? By those who have the gifts that are given to them by God. Christ gives these people to the church so they will serve the church in helping it mature in every phase of unity until they are like Christ in maturity. I'm going to give you a strange image uh, to hold in your mind just for a moment to understand this complex passage, okay, in just an image. Imagine you have a doll, just a doll, okay, a regular doll, and the head of the doll is the head of an adult. Usually the doll has a baby face and a baby body, right? But this doll has an adult head. It would be kind of strange, but you know, go along with me for a moment. The, 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 the doll has a, an adult head, but it has a baby's body. That's the church. The head is Christ, fully matured, fully formed. His body is the church, still a baby's body still needing growth, still needing to be fed, still needing to be developed, still needing to mature. And what Paul is saying here is that the body will eventually mature and grow to equal what the head is already. So it's as if the baby's doll today in fast motion and in graphic arts, you know, uh, yeah, I'm sure Allie could design this if she, if she put her mind to it. Uh, we, we could watch a, a, a video of, of an adult head on a baby's body and then we could see the baby's body completely mature to being an adult to match the head. Well, that, that's what Paul is, is describing here in verses 12 and 13. And then in verses 14 to 16, he mentions or describes the results of this unity. He says in verses 14 to 16, as a result, we are no longer, as a result of what? Well, as a result of this unity and this maturity, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is uh, the head. See the growing up of the body to be equal to the head there. And then in verse 16 he says, from whom the whole body being filled and held together by what every joint supplies, each part helping the other, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for what? for the building up of itself in love. And so, what are the results of unity? Breaking it down. First, we are firmly planted in the word, not easily seduced by lies or tricks or the plans of the evil one. 
We're able to speak the truth in love, no gossip, no division, no hypocrisy, the ability to speak the word to the lost and those who are struggling among the saved. Maturity, becoming like Jesus in our attitude and in our character. In other words, truly united to him. Remember the doll imagery. And then cooperation in mutual service. The body functioning in the way that the head directs for the strengthening of each and every member. The idea is that the body is to grow to the point of maturity that the head has already accomplished. We become like Jesus, perfectly united to the Father and to the Spirit. God provides the key elements to the body to help its every part grow towards this ideal. So let me summarize. Of course, like conformity, there's also a downside to the pursuit of unity. The cost of unity is discomfort. It's discomfort. It's not easy maintaining love and patience and gentleness and forbearance with someone you disagree with about one Lord, one faith, one baptism. You see what I'm saying? It's not easy to maintain that attitude with people you don't like, basically. That's why conformity is so appealing. Everybody agrees or they're out. It's easy to get along with people because you only keep the ones who agree with you. But God says we need to make an effort to maintain unity through peace since he knew it wouldn't be easy because we're not all the same and we're not all at the same maturity level. And we've been taught different things in the past and we're sinful and our sins limit our understanding and we've misunderstood and forgotten what we've been taught in many, in many cases. So it's not easy to get along to be patient and loving towards those who don't agree with us. But making the effort to maintain unity despite these obstacles is the true test of our discipling because Jesus said the following, by this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Notice that he did not say all men will know you are my disciples by how big a group you are. Or all men will know you're my disciples uh, because uh, you're all the same. Or that you all know the doctrines by heart. Or that you think you're right. Or that uh, you're very motivated to do things. That, that's, not, that's not the proof. All those who confessed Christ and were buried in baptism have been added to a divinely united circle that includes the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the church. And so the greatest task we have as Christians is to maintain that unity and that oneness by loving one another despite our differences. That's the key. Those who know and truly understand what I am saying in this lesson must realize that they are on the front lines of charting a new course for the unity of the church. I hope we can learn the hard lessons that have divided so many of our congregations in the past. I pray that this generation will be known as the ones who sought after and won once again the unity and the peace in the church that has been so carelessly harmed by past generations. So if you're separated from God by disbelief and sin, then I exhort you to repent and be baptized in order to be united to God through Christ and added to his church. And if you're separated from the church or you're separated from your brother or sister in Christ because of unfaithfulness or because of sin, then I encourage you to come and be restored to unity through prayer as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement. Shall we do that now, please?